At the end of today's Pasha, Hashem tells Moshe, uh, Avram Avinu, it's time to have a Brit Milah. So, there's a famous question, why didn't Avram do the mitzvah, uh, Milah before Hashem told him to do the mitzvah? He did all the other mitzvahs. So one answer is because, the simple answer, mitzvah mila is not something you could do again. All the other mitzvahs, let's say, eating kosher. So you could do it before Hashem tells you, you could do it afterwards. Mila, you get one chance, one shot. Once it's over, it's over. He was waiting for Hashem to give him the okay. Why? Because it's a much higher level to do a mitzvah that Hashem commands you rather than doing it on your own. Of course, doing it on your own is very special. But when Hashem gives you the, 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 the command and you do it, it's a higher level. Why? This is what the Rebbe explains it. It says that the mitzvah of Mila is a brit. It's a covenant. What's a covenant? You make a pact. You make a deal. You make a connection, a commitment to whoever it is, whether it's to your wife or your partner, or over here, it's Hashem himself is making an agreement with you, a commitment hey, hey, hey. that no matter what happens, you're staying committed to each other. That's what a Brit is. Nothing can break the relationship. Even if you get upset at each other, you have to work it out. Even if you feel that you're, 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 that the other person is not behaving, you have to work it out. Out. That's what the Brit is. So Avram could not do the Brit Mila, the Mila before Hashem commanded him, because then it's missing the whole impact. Brit Mila. It's not just Mila, it's Brit Mila. It's a Brit, it's a covenant, it's a it's a, a commitment. Who are you making commitment with? You need Hashem to participate in the process. This also the answer. So, so this is also the reason why you make a Brit Mila on a child when he's eight years old. Why don't you wait till he's thirteen? Such a big mitzvah. Wait till he's my mitzvah. So he'll get more credit. The Rabbi explains. If it's something that you do, it's a regular mitzvah. You're right. So you wait till thirteen. But since the Brit Mila is something that Hashem is involved in making a deal with you, making a pact with you, making a, a connection with you, a covenant with you, so He doesn't need you to, to wait till you're 13 years old. He wants to do it right away with you. He's not asking you to, to, to be mature, to be obligated in the mitzvahs. He wants, you should do it right away as soon as you can. Why? Because it's unconditional love and a connection that Hashem has with every person. The Gemara tells us that the Brit Mila is what is the the mitzvah that the Jewish people continue to perform besimcha. Other things they don't always do besimcha. And the Gemara doesn't say what I'm going to tell you. Other mitzvahs not everyone performs. But Brit Mila. 90% of the Jewish people, well, let's say 99%, I want to say 100, but everyone does the bris mila. Why? Here we have a Jew from Russia, he'll tell you, that even in Russia, and even what was dangerous, many people had a bris mila, and if not, as soon as they came out of Russia, the USSR, the Soviet Union, as soon as they got to another to the, the country where it was easy to do the Brit Mila, by the way, they performed the Brit Mila. Why? Older people, elderly people, how do they do it? So the Gemara says, because originally when they were they accepted the mitzvah, they accepted it besimcha. And since they accepted it besimcha, it continues this till this very day also the same. No, by Matan Torah. In Egypt they also they didn't do it so much the 
It says that only the Levim, only the Levim, and then right before they left Mitzrayim, they did they did the bris milah because they wanted to eat from the carbon pesa. Oh, okay. They were going crazy from the smell, from the aroma of the of the of the of the barbecue of the carbon pesa. But by Matan Torah, they accepted it to Simcha. And yeah. Simcha Torah, the more you celebrate, you can carry that joy into every mitzvah for the rest of the year. Very good. But Simcha's Torah is not one of the 613 mitzvahs. It's true. It well, says that what you could accomplish with the Simcha of Simcha's Torah, you can accomplish what you, what you, what you, redo, what you accomplish, what you impact on, on Rosh Hashanah through Tefillah, you could do more through the Simcha Simcha's Torah. That Simcha's connected to Simcha. I mean, it's of course it's connected at some level, but it's not a mitzvah in the Torah to dance with the Torah is on Simcha's Torah. In fact, it's not even mentioned in the Gemara. It's only a minhag. It's brought in one place in the Zoya. So I see the sense. Because Hashem doesn't want to tell us to dance with the Torahs. That has to come from our own joy. If you're a happy Jew, if you're a normal Jew, you want to dance with the Torahs. Because this is your greatest a gratitude to Hashem. Hashem has to tell you, be happy with the Torah. He tells us to be happy on Sukkot. He tells us to be happy on and, 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 uh, Pesach, Shavuos, and every Chag. Specifically, it's Masim Chastenu, which is Sukkot. Why? Because it follows Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. And it follows all the... There's many reasons. He tells us, rejoice. What does it mean to rejoice? Don't rejoice just because you had a good season. Because Sukkot is called Zman HaOsif. You're gathering in all the grain. So maybe that's why you're happy. No! Be happy because it's a mitzvah to be happy. Because Hashem wants you to be happy. Because it's b'chagecho. Because it's b'samach to It's It's b'fnei Hashem al-kecho, it says in the Torah. Samach to You should be happy in front of Hashem. That's correct. But still doesn't say the answer to the Torah. Come, the rabbis came along and said, Chevre, wake up. When are we going to dance with the Torahs? What are we waiting for? Even Purim we don't dance with the Torahs. We don't dance with the Torahs. It doesn't say any way you should dance. It should be the Simcha. Very good. If you want to dance, you can dance. But it's not part of the program. It's not, it's not a minhag. It's not something that's official. How you should be Simcha? Seeing, dance, clap, drink, make other people happy. Give people gifts, a tzedakah, matan and slavyanim, shleachmanis. Everything is good, but dancing with the Torahs, simchas Torah. What you just said is correct. If you dance, if you're going to be the simcha, sukkahs, especially shmini etzer, simchas Torah. Hashem is going to help you that you're going to be the simcha with the Torah and with the mitzvahs a whole year. Amen. The Rebbe continues here. He says, why? The, the halacha is that you don't make a shechiyonu on the mitzvah of mila. Even though I think some svardim, Shimshim will tell us, they make a shechiyonu, right? During the ceremony? But not on the mitzvah itself. They make a shechiyonu, but not on the mitzvah as they're cutting. Right. So why is the... Why don't we say shechiyonu? Because the tzar Because... The child, the baby has tzad, has pain. Therefore, we can't rejoice right now. So that's correct. On the other hand, everyone's happy by a bris milah. So the Rebbe asks, so why, why, why does Hashem give us a mitzvah that causes pain? If the baby's crying. And it's known that when the baby cries during the bris, at that moment, the heavens open up and you can ask for, from Hashem anything you need. Because the, the, the crying of the baby is, is because he's going through a heavy, doing a heavy mitzvah, making a, a covenant with Hashem, and everyone's present. And this comes from Avram Avinu. There's a lot happening, and Aliyah Nobi is there. So the heavens are open. Hashem is saying, now you can daven. Whose mitzvah is it? Whose mitzvah is it? It's the mitzvah of the baby, but the baby is not obligated yet. He didn't decide. Huh? He didn't say, I'm going to do this mitzvah. <laughs> the father has the obligation, but it's 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 the, it's the uh, 
ultimately it's the baby, it's the child, it's the baby's mitzvah. This is the only mitzvah that there absolutely is no question as to whether or not it's Kavano or, or D. It says an interesting thing. On one hand, it's the Simcha. Everyone else is the Simcha. Mazel tov, mazel tov, everyone's happy. A new child came down, we're a new neshama. Right? We're, we're happy, and Hashem is surely happy. And we just said that the Gemara says that Bris Miller, the Jews, accepted from the beginning Bris But the reality is there's pain. The Rebbe says like this. This comes to teach us a great lesson. In general, it says in the Shulchan Aruch, a person has no right to inflict pain on themselves. Because the body doesn't belong to you, which is one of the reasons, one of the reasons, you're not allowed to make a tattoo on yourself. This body does. This physical body doesn't belong to you. It's only lent to you. You're borrowing it from Hashem for 80, 90 years to do mitzvahs, 100 years to do mitzvahs, to learn Torah. It's not yours. It belongs to Hashem. <coughs> so you can't abuse yourself. However, when it comes to doing mitzvah, over there Hashem says, you can go through uh, even sad, even if it costs you pain, it hurts you, don't worry about it. It's only temporary. The benefit, the, the impact of the mitzvah is so much greater than the temporary, short-term pain and discomfort. When a Jew decides to do a mitzvah, to do what Hashem wants, to do his shlichus, to do his mission for Hashem, even if there's obstacles and there's challenges and there's difficulties, you'll see if you do it for Hashem entirely, exclusively, the Shem Shemayim, you try your best, Hashem ultimately will remove those obstacles and remove those challenges. And one great example is what I mentioned before, that you know, literally whole generation, maybe two generations of people who came up from the U.S., from the former Soviet Union, and they didn't let them do bris, they didn't let them do uh, eat kosher, they didn't let them do anything connected with Torah. Everything they had to do was under undercover, hiding in incognito. In, they had to conceal everything, but they came it made them stronger. It made them stronger because they were always looking forward. When can I finally do a mitzvah without being restricted? This Jew today, Alex, walked in here at, at 5.30 to put on tefillin. No, oh, he came to, 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 to pray. And I offered him to put on tefillin. And he said to me, he got emotional, he said, I only put one time in my life before tefillin. I said, give me the schus, give me the mitzvah, I want to put on tefillin, so sure, come, Rabbi, help me. So what drives a Jew on a, month, on a Tuesday or Monday afternoon, today is not the, the high holidays, what, brings, what makes him come to shul? He's happy, he's here, he's sitting, wants to be with us. Because his grandfather had Mesidus Nefesh had to put his life in danger in Russia to make a minion, to keep Shabbos, to keep to learn Torah, to do mitzvahs. And this went into his DNA. Yes, Alex. Yeah, I just remember that it was a simple era when we know about this holiday, but parents, grandparents don't want to tell us where is the synagogue, where is the celebration. And as the Moscow was one or two synagogues for that. So, and uh, I know that people go in there and this is dancing and, and this is, uh, you meet a lot of Jews because I grew up where it's like in my school. And uh, that's it. So for us in Russia, you meet other person, you immediately recognize that this person is Jewish. And I don't know France. how, but we do. It can be in transportation, it can be anywhere. And you became friends and sometimes friends for life. That's how it, people, Jews, were so dispersed in some cities. In Ukraine, maybe there's 
there's uh, there was more places where uh, Jews, more Jews was living around. But in Moscow, Petersburg, you know, it's and um, what I want to say that um, I was desperate. I was desperate to go and find that place, and I just know the old name for the street. It was called Maraseka, but that was renamed. So I almost hope, uh, lost all my hope to find the place. And then I decide, I was just, uh, you know, like um, probably like uh, 15 or 16 years old. And I came to police in Moscow. And I asked him, you know, I know that today is a day when the Jews celebrate some kind of holiday. And I just know that other my friends go in there because we're going to beat them over there. Can you tell me uh, where to find the place? He said, I don't know, but why the second? Why the second? What, what, what are you going to do? So me and my friends, were not Jewish, but we're going there because we know the Jews, the young Jews are over there. So we want to give them hard time. So he said, why the second? So he called in uh, his uh, special phone and Okay. And then he gave me the name of the street. This was a street, a street uh, Arkipov Street, in a, in a, a square, Nagina Square. So, and I jump in the subway, and I was over there, and I hear from the subway somewhere people, lots of people singing, and you you hear the echo, you know, and you go there and. You see the street, which is, was a little bit on a slope going. You see lots of people, and they all young, because the older people was inside of the temple. And we was, and I, and I just coming closer and closer, and I just couldn't believe it, that I can see, say, I mean like young Jewish people, so many of them, it just, it was amazing. It was amazing, you know. And then we was wait until the uh, people from temple coming out. I saw my grandfather, and uh, you know he was surprised how I got there <laughs> because they didn't, they didn't want us to get in trouble. Wow. Thank you for sharing this information.